All right. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to uh, Mr. Jackson's fourth period uh, government econ class. You are about to experience uh, Woodward Academy uh, Debate Week, um, in which there will be a series of professional debaters arguing various topics um, that affect America today, as well as some student debaters arguing um, similar topics as well. Up first, what we have is a professional debate by um, our very own Mr. Bill Batterman, who is Assistant Director of the Woodward Academy Debate Program, and Ms. Maggie Berthume, who is the Director of the Woodward Academy Debate Program. Um, Ms. Berthume and Mr. Batterman will be debating the issue of school vouchers. So, uh, without further ado, um, let's turn our cameras over to um, Ms. Maggie Berthume, who will be arguing the pro student vouchers, and Mr. Batterman, who will be arguing the con student vouchers. Improving education is vital to the future of all Georgians, and significant improvements require real changes and new choices for how and where students learn. Changes inevitably involve a process of trial and error as Georgia explores the best ways to improve education, especially for the state's neediest, most vulnerable children. But improving education also requires the state to recognize if and when a trial has become an error. Georgia's tax credit program for private school choice has failed the state's children and Georgia taxpayers. It is time to end Georgia's failed experiment. This stark assessment of Georgia's tax credit scholarships as presented by the Southern Education Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to better and more accessible education, compels us to support today's resolution. Resolved, the Georgia Tuition Tax Credit Scholarship Program should be abolished. Georgia's tax credit scholarship programs, exemplified by Georgia Goal, the largest such program, harm Georgia students and gravely injure our educational system. Abolishing these programs is a key step to ensure the future success of all of Georgia's youth. The tuition tax credit scholarship program allows Georgia's taxpayers to reduce the amount of taxes they owe to the state by donating to a private student scholarship organization, or SSO. For every dollar paid to the SSO, the individual or corporation owes a dollar less in state taxes. This allows individuals and corporations to pay money to a private school instead of to the state of Georgia. In the first three years of the program, $72 million were diverted from state revenues to private scholarships. The program was designed to help move low-income students out of failing public schools and give parents input into which schools their children attend. Georgia's politicians spoke eloquently of the need to give school choice to our most disadvantaged children. They argue that low-income students should have the same access to school choice, including the ability to attend a private school, as our wealthy families currently do. By increasing the number of scholarships available and the funding for those scholarships, they believe they can reach that goal. We agree that policies should be designed with the least advantaged in mind. However, Georgia's program hurts the very students it was designed to help. First, despite politician rhetoric, the scholarships are not granted to low-income students. The Southern Education Foundation explains that there is no evidence that SSOs have used grants to distribute scholarships primarily to low-income students. The Georgia law fails to set income limits for eligibility, a fact that makes Georgia the only state in the nation with tax credit scholarships that does not limit to students with real financial need. Moreover, students receiving the scholarships don't even need to be current public school students. Many recipients of the scholarships are current private school students, not students leaving the public school system. Notably, a Southern Education Fund survey sent to all active SSOs and 67 private schools prompted not one response in which an SSO named a single public school that a scholarship recipient had attended before receiving a tax-funded scholarship at a private school. Additionally, even with the maximum scholarship, private schools are still too expensive for low-income families. Claire Suggs, the senior education analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, who holds a master's degree in public affairs from the La Follette School of Public Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, explains that the annual tuition at many private schools is $14,000 or more. This is well above the current cap on the scholarship award, which could put many of these schools out of reach for low-income families. Even with maximum use, Goal leaves private schooling out of reach of low-income students. Instead, it diverts money from public schools at the worst time possible, directly harming the low-income students it purports to target. Suggs continues, 
In this time of significantly limited financial resources and with the pressing need to dramatically improve the knowledge and skills of Georgia's workforces, new investments in education must maximize the possible benefits for the largest number of students with the greatest need. Nearly 60% of Georgia's public school students are low income. These students, and there are more than one million of them, struggle in school. Low income students need extra support to match the academic success of middle and upper income students. The private school scholarship tax credit program does not direct money to these students. If these students benefit, it is by chance, not by design. Proponents of the law will argue that by moving students out of public schools without reducing overall funding levels, tax scholarships actually save public schools money. This is false. Tax scholarships not only don't help low-income students move out of public schools, they reduce the quality of education within those public schools, magnifying the rich-poor gap in educational outcomes. The only study to determine that tax scholarship programs save schools money is from the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. However, its results simply do not apply to Georgia. The Southern Education Foundation examined the study and compared it point by point to Georgia's law. They found three major problems. First, because many of Georgia students are current private school students, not transfers from public school, there is no possible cost savings. The government is simply paying families to continue private schooling. Second, because the cost to the state includes not just the scholarship amounts, but also administrative and other costs of the program, the cost to the state is much higher with tax scholarships than with public schooling. SEF found that SSO scholarships cost the state government $7,500 more per student than sending that same student to public school. Third, the report assumes that when students transfer out of public schools, it reduces the cost for those schools. However, these scholarships actually increase costs by diverting the highest income students who are the least expensive to educate and leaving school districts with only the most difficult students and high fixed costs for buildings and maintenance. Finally, keep in mind that advocates of programs should prove that they have measurable benefits, not simply that they're not that bad. Make the negative prove that this program helps substantial numbers of low income students, not just subsidizes private schools for wealthy families who are already there. The burden of proof is on the negative to demonstrate that we ought to maintain a costly program with no real benefits. The facts are clear. Low income students don't benefit because they still can't afford private schooling. And reducing overall state revenues harms the public school system that actually educates most of Georgia's youth. When it comes to kids and their future, Georgia has had enough with bad report cards. It's time to stop searching for reasons to destroy a benevolent program that allows Georgians to give their own money to a private sector program that puts children first. It's because I agree with Leslie Heiner of the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice that I negate the resolution and oppose ending Georgia's tuition tax credit scholarship program. First, the tax credit scholarship program is an important enabler of school choice. Malcolm Glenn of the American Federation for Children explains that scholarship tax credit programs give families greater access to high quality private schools by providing incentives for corporations and individual taxpayers to get involved in improving education. The fundamental outcome is giving kids expanded educational options by allowing public monies to follow the child as opposed to being relegated to a system. It puts the power in the hands of the parents who are most equipped to make the best educational decision on behalf of their child. Second, improving school choice should be a major goal for Georgia because it has a proven track record across the nation. Jason Bedrick, a policy analyst at the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute and a graduate of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, concludes that there is clear evidence that students benefit by participating in educational choice programs. Numerous randomized, controlled studies have demonstrated that students in choice programs exhibit higher academic performance, while additional studies have found higher graduation rates, increased college enrollment, and increased civic mindedness. This month, the Friedman Foundation released a new report that conclusively demonstrates these overwhelming benefits using the, the best available evidence. Bedrick explains that the report provides a literature review of dozens of high quality studies of school choice programs around the country, including studies from scholars at Harvard University, Stanford University, Cornell University, the Brookings Institution, and the Federal Reserve Bank. The report's key findings included the following. Twelve empirical studies have examined academic outcomes for school choice participants using random assignment, the gold standard of social science. Of these, 11 find that choice improves student outcomes. 
no empirical study has found a negative impact. 23 empirical studies, including all methods, have examined school choice's impact on academic outcomes in public schools. 22 find that choice improves public schools, and one finds no visible impact. No empirical study has found that choice harms public schools. Third, given this overwhelming evidence, decision makers should be highly skeptical of advocacy by the anti-school choice authors cited by the affirmative. Heiner of the Friedman Foundation contends that change is difficult to embrace and organizations such as the Southern Education Foundation and others entrenched in the education establishment refuse to reform a system that has failed kids for decades. They desperately search for problems with this new private sector program to take the focus off a of failing taxpayer-funded monopoly. The affirmative prevents, presents two major gripes with the program, that it doesn't sufficiently help low-income students and that it diverts money from public schools. First, it is important to note that low-income students are shamefully underserved by public schools in Georgia. Heiner explains that Georgia continues to be in the basement in SAT rankings. Education Week ranked Georgia among the bottom five with a graduation rate of 58.5%. This tax credit program is making it possible to educate children at schools with more stellar success stories. Given this reality, it makes sense that parents would want to provide their children with more options. The burden should be on the affirmative to prove that this choice should be taken away from families seeking better schools. Before abolishing a program that supports Georgia's families, decision makers should be certain that the costs outweigh the substantial benefits. Remember, this is a voluntary program that gives taxpayers the choice to fund scholarships. If Georgia residents and businesses were not convinced of its benefits, they would not support it. Taxpayers, not anti-choice activists, should make that decision. Second, tax credit scholarships do benefit low-income students. Bedrick disputes the characterization of the program as robbing the poor to pay the rich, explaining that the reality is almost exactly the opposite. Donors are not benefiting financially at the expense of the poor or anyone. While it is true that tax credit scholarships do not always cover the full cost of tuition at private schools, thanks to low-cost options and need-based tuition breaks, low-income families are the primary beneficiaries of STC programs. Certainly, some students who receive scholarships are already attending private schools. But there's nothing wrong with alleviating the financial burden on families that have chosen to invest in their children's futures. Moreover, no data exists to support the affirmative's argument. Recent changes have made the tax credit program more transparent. The Augusta Chronicle reports in early April that the Georgia General Assembly passed an expansion to the state's tax credit scholarship program. The bill came with stricter transparency guidelines for SSOs, like GOAL. When SSOs donate money to private schools for scholarships, the law now requires them to consider the financial needs of student applicants and to file an independent audit with the Department of Revenue. If the affirmative is right, this will become evident in coming years. Canceling the program now, based on speculation, doesn't make sense and deprives taxpayers the opportunity to choose for themselves whether the program should be supported. Third, the tax credit scholarship program increases overall education spending by diverting tax dollars from the general fund to education. As the Atlanta Business Chronicle reports, according to the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice, state-funded scholarships actually put more money into education. Robert Enlow, the group's executive director, explained that every dollar a state spends on public schools yields a net gain of only 53 cents because local governments adjust to that state spending by reducing their commitment by 47 cents. So every dollar of a scholarship is a dollar for education. The affirmative objects to the Friedman Foundation's studies, but the thesis of the argument is indisputable. By diverting tax dollars to the scholarship program, taxpayers are ensuring that their tax liability is spent on education, not on something else. The nitpicking by affirmative authors reveals their anti-choice agenda that makes the perfect the enemy of the good. Instead of abolishing Georgia's successful tax credit scholarship program, we should be celebrating it. While the negative correctly identifies the value of school choice in the abstract, these benefits are not accrued by Georgia's scholarship program. There are several problems with the negative so-called school choice arguments. First, Georgia students already have ample school choice programs. Catherine Dunn explains that there are a lot of school choice options in public schools, such as charter schools, magnet schools, and open enrollment, where students are not confined to their neighborhood school. We see some schools that work and some that don't in each of these school choice programs. We do need options for students within public schools not more choices on how to subsidize private schools that are unaccountable for how they educate children. 
Extending the tax credit program does not trap students in poor performing schools. The negative's hyperbolic rhetoric should be ignored. Second, Georgia's program does not target low-income individuals. Claire Suggs reiterates that the program has been likened to a voucher program. Comparing it to voucher programs in other states, it is evident that Georgia differs. The Fordham Institute notes that of the seven state voucher programs, five are directed to families with limited financial resources, one is for students attending failing schools, and one requires students to come from low-income families and attend a poor-performing school. The negative cites evidence from Bedrick suggesting that tax credits do target low-income students, but this evidence is not about Georgia. Because scholarships are for less than the average cost of a private school, only middle and high income families can take advantage of them and afford that tuition. There is no evidence that Georgia's program helps low income students escape failing schools. Third, beneficiaries of Georgia's tax credit scholarships are already attending those private, uh, private schools. Remember, the Southern Education Foundation undertook a comprehensive review of the program and could not find evidence that even one student who received a scholarship used it to transfer out of a public school. Fourth, even if public school students were receiving scholarships, these students are already attending the best public schools in the state. Because Georgia does not target students from failing schools, it benefits the students who are already academically privileged. The SEF contends that most of the private schools currently working with SSOs to receive tax funds to finance student scholarships are in the five counties that also have Georgia's higher performing public schools. The current law is developing tax-funded educational choice in locations that already have the state's most academically competitive public high schools. Extolling the benefits of school choice in the abstract is not enough to, to justify the Georgia's tax credit scholarship program. Opponents of the program are not anti-choice, they are pro-education. The negative is right to suggest that Georgia's schools are failing, but the root cause is underfunding of public education, something the tax credit scholarship program makes worse. Remember, SEF found that every scholarship costs the state an additional $7,000 per student. This money could be used instead to improve public education and workplace development, two urgent priorities for Georgia. Claire Suggs contends that the state has underfunded public education for a decade. In the current school year, Georgia is underfunding public schools by $1.1 billion. The state per pupil investment is falling, yet the statewide cap on the tax credit for private school scholarships is increasing. This provides a benefit to participating taxpayers and private schools at a time when public schools are cutting instructional days, furloughing teachers, and increasing tax sizes. The increase diverts more potential revenue away from the state. This means less funding for critical investments like education and workforce development. By canceling this program, Georgia could substantially increase its overall investment in education. Suggs proposes a comprehensive approach. It's very comprehensive. The show must go on. Suggs proposes a comprehensive approach. There are strategic investments in Georgia that could make with in programs with clearer returns than Georgia's private scholarship program. One, replicate the federal school improvement grant program. Two, provide more time for learning. Georgia could follow the path of higher performing states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, Tennessee, and Colorado and provide additional learning time for students in high need schools. Three, transform teacher preparation. A new model has been developed by reform organizations. Teachers trained through these programs are more likely to stay in the classroom and to improve student achievement. With funding, all of the teacher preparation programs in Georgia could be similarly restructured. This is a better way to improve education in Georgia. Suggs concludes the best place for the state to invest its limited financial resources is in teacher and principal quality. Teacher quality is the greatest school-based factor in student achievement. Principals are the second greatest school-based factor. Despite this, the state significantly reduced funding. Restoring funding is a key recommendation of the state's Education Finance Study Commission. Many possible investments could lead to better teaching and education outcomes across Georgia schools that serve students with the greatest needs. For these reasons, Georgia's tax credit scholarship program should be abolished, and the tax dollars should be invested back where they belong, in the state's public schools. Both sides agree that school choice is important, and that Georgia should strive to provide families with the best possible educational options for their students. The nexus question of this debate is whether the tax credit scholarship program contributes to this goal, 
or whether students would be better off if tax dollars were redirected to the state's general fund. My contention, supported by the preponderance of evidence, is that the benefits of the program outweigh the costs. Is the program perfect? Of course not. Tax credit scholarship programs in other states are doing a better job of furthering the goals of school choice. But Georgia's program is a step in the right direction. As I explained earlier, recent improvements to the program improve transparency and the requirement that SSOs like Goal consider students' financial needs will also pay dividends. Families that are reaping substantial benefits from expanded educational options should not be punished because the program is imperfect. Remember, the scholarship program is voluntary. Individuals and businesses across Georgia are voting with their pocketbooks by voluntarily choosing to redirect their tax dollars. This decision makes sense. Georgians know the sad reality that our state ranks near the bottom in rankings of SAT scores and graduation rates, and they are dissatisfied with the educational status quo. The choice to contribute to the scholarship fund is like the choice to give money to charity. As Heiner explains, these are private organizations working with private dollars donated by individuals and not redirected government money. Individuals and companies freely choose to donate to these worthwhile groups just as they would choose to send their hard-earned dollars to a charity they've selected. The decision to end the program should be made by taxpayers, not by activists with an anti-choice agenda. The affirmative is right that other options exist for school choice, but these options do not provide families with the ability to attend a private school if they decide that it is the best fit for their child. In many cases, this is the right decision. A profile in the Augusta Chronicle, for example, highlights that there was a time when private schools seemed out of reach for Patricia Hester's family. When she discovered Heritage Academy for her granddaughter, it seemed like a perfect fit but the structure, academic rigor, uniforms, and violin lessons all came at a price. The $6,000 tuition would have been a deal breaker for Hester and her granddaughter if not for the Georgia Tuition Tax Credit Scholarship Program. Like the majority of students at Heritage, Hester's granddaughter receives financial aid from Georgia Goal. I couldn't imagine her being anywhere else, but without the scholarship, it would be a struggle, Hester said. Hester is one of thousands of students who have benefited from the Tax Credit Scholarship Program. While the affirmative might be correct in noting that many scholarship recipients are middle income or already attending a private school, this is not a reason for criticism. Assisting Georgia families finance their children's education is a worthy goal regardless of their demographics. The affirmative is also correct to note the importance of education funding, but there is no forced choice between the tax credit scholarship program and increased funding for public education. The program is not meant to replace funding for public schools, only to supplement it by providing families with additional choices in meeting the educational needs of their children. The affirmative will argue that there is no political support for increased education spending, but this proves the importance of the scholarship program. In an atmosphere where budgets are tight, a voluntary tax credit program is a creative way to incentivize taxpayers to contribute directly to meeting the state's education needs. Canceling the program is unlikely to result in additional money for public schools. Sacrificing the scholarship program with the hope that state and local legislators will vote to raise taxes during tough economic times is likely to prove disappointing. Even an imperfect program is better than nothing when it comes to meeting the needs of Georgia students. The affirmative has highlighted many valid criticisms of Georgia's tax credit scholarship program. In the end, however, abolishing the program makes the perfect the enemy of the good. By expanding choice and empowering families, the program is an important component in an overall educational agenda that will help Georgia prepare its students to meet the demands of the 21st century. Abolishing the program is a knee-jerk reaction that exaggerates its shortcomings and ignores its many benefits. I encourage you to vote negative and to side with Georgia's families. This trial has become an error. My opponent says we shouldn't sacrifice the good enough on the altar of the perfect. But by pretending that this program is good enough, we stop striving for better. Is that what we want to teach our students? Georgia's program is a talking point, not an educational program. By convincing legislators they've provided choice and our middle and upper class families that they don't need to care about public schools, it does irreparable harm to Georgia's education system. The program is voluntary only for the wealthy. Remember, students in lower funded public schools still have no choice. There is no evidence that anyone is transferring out of public school. Additionally, the state of Georgia is paying more for students to attend private school than public school. That's ridiculous. We don't need to raise taxes to improve education for all of Georgia students. We simply need to stop giving $72 million to wealthy families to continue elite education. Instead, 
We need to direct those dollars to provide improved choice and public school options for all of Georgia's students. Thank you. on the issue of, of school vouchers generally and um, how Georgia uses school vouchers more specifically. Um, we have in our studio here today during Woodward Academy Debate Week, we have um, uh, Dr. Gully, the president of Woodward Academy. Um, Dr. Gully, welcome to Woodward Academy Debate Week and thank you for taking time out of your busy day, I'm sure, um, to be part of, of, of this particular process. Glad to be here. All right, now, um, Specifically, I have, a, I have a number of questions um, regarding this particular uh, debate uh, more generally, and then specifically about the, um, uh, the tax credit program. I, 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 and I want to thank you for agreeing to come in and, and answer these questions. Uh, first of all, you heard the arguments about the debate today um, regarding the merits of a school voucher program. What is the official stance of Woodward Academy with respect to Georgia's participation in allowing taxpayers to defer part of their tax liability um, to this program? Well, let me say first of all that I'm very impressed with the presentation from Mrs. Berthium and Mr. Batterman. I think they articulated very well the arguments on both sides of this issue. And uh, I agree. if we can be half as articulate <laughs> tomorrow in our discussion <laughs> about drug testing, it should be a very interesting debate tomorrow. Yes. Uh, but I think they have presented to the students uh, the role of debate and uh, how we can engage in civil and spirited conversation on matters of public importance. In terms of Woodward's perspective on the Georgia tax credit program, uh, I, it would be uh, misleading to say that Woodward has an official policy statement on the matter. Uh, I think by our actions, however, it can be interpreted that we support the program because we do receive students who are eligible for these dollars, and those dollars then go toward paying for their tuition here. I think the distinction here needs to be understood that the student scholarship organization, in our case we're using the Georgia Gold uh, uh, organization, uh, the money is supporting the student. It's not supporting Woodward Academy. Okay. So the money is going to defray the student's tuition here at Woodward, although the money is sent directly to Woodward and goes on to the student's account. I see. All right. Um, let's talk a little more generally. Um, who, is, who is eligible to participate in uh, Georgia's program? Well, right now the legislation has changed and the uh, only way that students going forward will be uh, eligible to participate in the program is if they have been enrolled in a public school for six weeks okay. or longer. Uh, there has been some concern that there has been abuse by students who are already enrolled in private institutions enrolling in a public institution just for the period of a day or two to demonstrate that they had public school residency and then and to qualify back. for these funds. We have never had that issue here. All right. of our students do indeed come to us from public institutions. Mm -hmm. There has never been an instance of a student at Woodward uh, who was here enrolled in a public institution for a period of a few days and then came back to Woodward. Right. All of these students have had long-standing tenures in the public sector before okay. coming to Woodward and this year we have 16 Georgia Gold students. Most of those students are in the high school. Okay, so the total number that Woodward Academy accepts is 16. Um, and that's for this year. Um, what, is, what do you see as a trend? How many, how many would you predict that Woodward can expect in years to come? Well, the number that we are able to award depends upon the amount of money that is directed by taxpayers through Georgia Gold for students attending Woodward Academy. Okay. So uh, up until this point, in the three years that Woodward has participated in the program, we have raised about $700,000. One of the things that we do that is uh, perhaps unique, though we're not the only school that does it, because of a concern that the legislature might discontinue the program, in order not to put at risk our financial aid dollars, we encumber dollars for uh, the Georgia Gold students right. uh, for the amount that they might be eligible. So two years ago, for example, the first Georgia Gold students who enrolled here could receive up to a maximum of $10,000. That, that number was established by the state. Okay. We then took $40,000 of available gold, gold money, 10,000 of that went toward the student's tuition, 
Another 30,000 of it continues to be encumbered by Georgia Gold, and we will draw down 10,000 for each, each year, year that the students here now. Each year, though, the amount that the state allows us to put toward that program has declined, so that this year it's $9,043. Okay. So, so as not to disadvantage those students who right. got used to the $10,000, we are using money out of our own financial aid budget to cover okay. that gap for students. All right, so then how much on average would you say that the, uh, that the Georgia Gold students receive from Warrior Academy through the Georgia Gold program and then from um, Warrior Academy's uh, other funds? Well, uh, they uh, receive what they are eligible for, which is $9,043 okay. uh, this year for the 16 students who enrolled here. There is no other student of the 16 that's getting more than $1,000, so at most our financial aid budget is exposed to about $16,000 if every one of those students was getting additional funding from us. Um, okay. All right. Um, now let's talk about some of the admission criteria. Um, is the admission criteria at Wilbur Academy altered? Um, by a student receiving uh, funds from this program? Absolutely not. Our admission decisions are completely need blind. So we have no uh, knowledge of the student's family's financial situation or their ability to pay. So we make admission decisions completely uh, on the merits of the application presented by the student, which includes the high school, well, the transcript of the student prior to coming here, right. testing that we require, the interview, letters of recommendation. Okay. At the point of admission then, uh, students may have simultaneously applied for financial aid and or Georgia Gold, okay. and at that point then we make a determination about whether or not the student may be eligible. For All right, so the admission funds. criteria is separate and distinct from the financial criteria. Exactly. And the admission, and the admission at Wilbur Academy is made without, without knowing or looking at the financial Exactly. We don't look at the student in the admission committee process say, well, this is a Georgia Gold student, and therefore we need to treat it differently in okay. some way. We don't, th those are entirely separate processes. All right. Now, once a student is accepted, regardless of whether they're accepted um, uh, through the program, um, do they receive assistance throughout the duration and tenure here at Woodward Academy? They have to demonstrate need each year. That's one of the requirements of Georgia Goal as a student scholarship organization is that the students, in order to continue receiving the funding, must demonstrate financial need in order to receive it. So uh, they would not release to us the funds that are available for that student if the family had not demonstrated it. And I can tell you, because we did some research on this, of the 16 students who are attending Woodward right now, using a third-party vendor that analyzes the financial need of families, right. those families have a demonstrated need of paying the Woodward tuition of $19,000. Okay. So there's still a wide gap between what Woodward and Georgia Gold are doing for these students and what they actually have to pay for the tuition in order to attend here. Okay, I see. Uh, um, let's talk about, is, is, there, is there any conflict between the program um, assistance that um, we're talking about here and the historical financial assistance that Woodward, Woodward Academy offers to students? No, uh, and because we encumber these funds uh, for Georgia Goal eligible students, we are intentionally trying to keep the programs as separate as possible so that our financial aid budget would not have to be the fallback in the okay. event that this program yeah. might go away, go away and then students would uh, want to remain at Woodward right. and then we would feel some obligation to support them financially. So we are actually, we could support more Georgia Goal eligible students right. with the money that's available in our account, but because we want to be as conservative as possible and to protect our financial aid budget, we elect uh, only to give students the money for which they're eligible from Georgia Gold and to encumber the rest for the potential remainder of the time they will be with us. Is there, is there a, a minimum age or a minimum grade level uh, for which a student would become eligible for the program? Well, the law allows for a student to be eligible as early as kindergarten. So, uh, and they don't obviously in that case have to be coming from a public institution because right. there would not have been one to have attended. <laughs> right. uh, but because we want to maximize the use of these dollars and manage our financial aid budget in ways that are responsible, we are for the most part limiting the program for our students to, to high school. school level? Okay. There may be one or two in the middle school, but the vast majority are in enrolling in ninth grade or Above. Or above. Okay. All right. Um, uh, tell us. Tell us. Tell us this, if you know. Um, how, how has this program um, and financial assistance um, contributed to the racial, cultural, socioeconomic diversity here at Woodward Academy? Uh, 
I wish I could give you that data. I don't have the background information on either the gender or racial makeup of right. these students. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't speak. Uh, that's, fine. I, I, um, that's fine. That's um, fine. Let's go to the next question. Um, based on your, this is my our final question for the day. All right. Based upon your experience um, with Georgia's new program, um, do you see this as an educational trend um, that other schools, other states will employ? Or do you think that the uproar is such that the legislation will reconsider and then no longer fund this particular program? Well, certainly there was a lot of debate in this last legislative session about this program <clears throat> to the point that uh, I think those who are in favor of the program carried the day in the sense that the cap, which in the past was $51.5 million, was increased to $58 plus million for the year to come. Um, I think that uh, there is interest by other states in this program whether or not they will choose to get on board uh, in the way that Georgia has along with say Florida and Arizona I right. think remains to be seen. Certainly I think that the number of independent schools in the state of Georgia that are aware of this program has grown significantly over the years such that while in the first year it took the entire calendar year to meet the gap of $50 million then we it's think that the $58 now. million <laughs> gap may be met as early as the end of this month oh, really? for the year. Okay, so, so uh, it's gone from a year to so take it to, to almost six months. Three, four, so three, four schools, months. schools uh, have become much more aggressive in getting with their prospective supporters of this okay. to uh, get them on board. And uh, so, in in the first quarter, certainly by the end of the second quarter, we think that uh, the maximum uh, cap will have been met. All right. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Gully, for providing a color commentary on the issue of school vouchers generally and the Georgia Gold Program um, specifically. Um, now, I'll, while you are here, I want to talk to you, uh, I'll give a little preview of what um, the audience can expect to see in, oh, let's uh, 10, 15 more minutes. Um, we have a couple of outside uh, presenters on this very issue, better experts in the field as they have been um, the uh, spokespeople in the Georgia legislature that you were talking about. Um, and so please stay tuned in about 15 minutes or so. We'll start uh, that debate. All right, and then also, uh, we're going to preview tomorrow's debate. Uh, you want to talk to them about that a little bit? Well, uh, in a weak moment, I agree to uh, <laughs> debate you tomorrow on uh, your resolution that we should discontinue the uh, student drug testing program, which we know that regardless of the outcome of the debate, the program will continue anyway. But I look forward to. Uh, the kind of civil and spirited exchange that Mrs. Uh, Berthume and Mr. Batterman uh, demonstrated on this topic, and that the two of you and I, the two of us, will have tomorrow on the topic of drug testing. And there you have it, folks, direct from Dr. Gully. All right, so you, so you heard it from you heard it from um, the president of Woodward Academy himself. Uh, tomorrow, please uh, tune in later on today for the um, debate on uh, school vouchers again um, by the. Um, um, the, the activists um, who are both for and against the, um, the uh, school voucher or tax liability program. All right, and then also uh, tune in tomorrow, um, same channel, uh, for a, another round of uh, Wilbur Academy Debate Week series, uh, this time regarding the Wilbur Academy's um, drug testing policy, in which you'll see both of us again argue both the pro and con of the Wilbur's uh, policy. Uh, thank you very much for watching um, and hope to see you again.